Okay, well, thank you all for coming out tonight. We're going to go ahead and get started. This is our kickoff meeting of the year uh, for the 2021-2022 year. Uh, I'm Elliot Locke, and uh, I appreciate you all for coming out tonight. And we'll have more people. Seems like more people are coming in as I speak. But to keep on time, we'll move forward. So the agenda for tonight will be a our uh, mission and a value proposition, and then a brief icebreaker, and then doing a recap of our 2021 year, and then introducing our 2021-2022 executive board and doing an oath of office ceremony. Then we'll have a brief uh, engagement activity and uh, go into our corporate spotlight uh, for John Deere. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kabob, for being here tonight. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Tony, for you know setting that up with John Deere. And then we'll have our keynote speaker, Mr. George Smith, uh, one of the Nesby founders, to give his uh, speech tonight. And we're looking forward to that. And uh, we'll have some brief zone updates, questions, and then adjourn the meeting. So what we like to do at all Nesby meetings is to start off with the Nesby mission. Uh, because we're virtual, it's uh, fairly difficult to say it all together like uh, we do when we're in person. Uh, so please just like say it uh, to your on your to yourself on on mute, and I'll just go ahead and say the mission to increase the number of culturally responsible Black engineers who excel academically succeed professionally and positively impact the community. And our Nesby Professionals value proposition, this is one that doesn't get uh, recited as much as the Nesby mission, and it applies more to the Nesby professionals. But in our meetings, we like to recite this and go through it because it is just very important to the mission of the society and complements the mission. And so the Nesby professionals inspire the next generation of technical professionals and serve as a catalyst for transforming the culture of engineering. And so those are our two mission, our mission statement and our professional values proposition. And we want to say a brief uh, celebration and recognition of National Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, which started yesterday and runs until October 15th. And Nesby, from a national standpoint, is doing a Hispanic Heritage Month STEM Innovators Program, which if you go to the uh, Region 2 Nesby Professionals uh, LinkedIn page or Instagram page, or the Process Improvement Special Interest Group, LinkedIn, or um, uh, Instagram page, you'll be able to find uh, these links and register for the programs. There's three of them in total, I believe, and uh, therefore uh, in honor of Hispanic uh, Heritage Month. So for our first icebreaker, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started with that. And what, you, what I would like for you to do is to, in the chat, to put your uh, first name, last name, your major in the school you went to, your current career role, and then one professional accomplishment that you're proud of. And so I'll go ahead and go first. Then I'm Elliot Locke. I did uh, chemical engineering at NC State, and uh, I currently work at Eli Lilly, and uh, I got my yellow belt certification.
Okay, so if everyone can do that, I'll go ahead and play. a brief video of a recap of last year's programming. Elliot, we're not hearing the sound. Okay, let me. I might have to reshare it.
the reason why I wanted to show that video is one, uh, to show the immense amount of things that were accomplished uh, under the leadership of Tony Arnold McFarland. And so uh, we appreciate your leadership, Tony, and uh, thank you for making our chapter great. And those are big shoes to fill uh, going into 2021 and 2022. Uh, but I can guarantee uh, that as we enter into 2021 and 2022, uh, there's a lot in store uh, from a national leadership perspective. Uh, we have four great leaders, just more than that, but in our particular region and then nationally that are leading the way for the 2021 and 2022 uh, term. Uh, our national chair, Favor Norris, our professionals chair, Ranisha Worthy, Dr. Ranisha Worthy, and our region two chair that goes, she goes by Olu, and our Region 2 Professionals Chair, uh, Ms. Renee, who is one of our own RTP NSBE members. And even our National Chair comes from Region 2. So we have a rich history of leaders, and that is the objective of NSBE. We are also entering a new, our new uh, leader is going to be Janine Uzel. And so she's coming from Wikimedia where she was the chief operating officer. And then in terms of national directives, uh, these are our national directives for this year, uh, which is hence the name of the program, Game Time 2021. It was just, it was a play on sports a little bit, but it's based on our national directives, which time represents transform NSBE, influence and advocacy, innovate NSBE programs and benefits, mobilize NSBE membership and evolve NSBE operations and governance. We are also uh, kind of doing a play on our Game Change 2025, which is our uh, plan to graduate 10,000 engineers, Black engineers by 2025, and the strategy that we're going about to do that uh, going for red uh, for engagement, board of our STEM professionals, and uh, I skipped one set for our college initiative programs and activities. And this is all aligned and available online uh, for us to target going after that goal of 10,000 uh, graduates annually by 2025. So, so far in 2021, we've had our 2021 Professional Development Conference uh, which was August 12th to the 14th. That's where I was able to participate in a lean uh, yellow belt class and got a certification there. Uh, and then for Duke Nesby, uh, they invited us to do a professionals panel where we had about four or five of our executive board members uh, talk about some of our professional experiences. And then our college initiative chair was invited to North Carolina a and uh, college meeting. And he attended that meeting uh, to interact and build relationships with the collegiate chapters. And so with that said, we're gonna go ahead and go into uh, doing our executive board introductions. And um, we're gonna start Basically, when I go to your slide, just make sure to, uh, you'll introduce yourself, say your name, uh, give a little bit about yourself, uh, keep it brief though. I tried to put some helpful hints on the slide. And so first we'll have our illustrious president emeritus, uh, Tony Arnold McFarland, uh, if you could, just say a few uh, things. I, I guess I introduced you for yourself. 
The first thing I want to say is, can I get a two hype? <laughs> two hype. Two hype. I put a link in the chat two in case you want to play it later on. But right. um, President Emeritus, I am glad to be sitting on the other side watching Elliot facilitate and 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 take the baton. Uh, he actually had passed it to me uh, for a couple of years, and now I passed it back to him. But um, I'm just excited to be on the sidelines a little bit, kind of working on some things that um, I didn't really get to finish up, but also being able to focus more on Nesby Jr. I will add to also Elliot for 2021, the PCI initiative uh, engaged 10 Nesby Jr. students in the um, Black Sick Microsoft uh, coding camp. And we had some Nesby, uh, RTP Nesby volunteers that participated in that and they graduated on August 21st. It was 12 weeks long. So hats off to all of you all for your support and participation. And I'm just looking forward to help out from the sidelines. Thanks, Tony. And that, that is true. There was an excellent and wonderful uh, PCI program with Microsoft. And I hope that we can keep doing those types of programs. I did mention where I work. John Deere, as you can see, analytics lead, uh, been there 23 years, and we'll, we'll, you'll hear more about us a little later. Also with the NC State, GOPAC, um, mechanical engineering. I'm done. Thanks, Tony. And she has a doctorate of ministry, so, <laughs> but so, I'm Elliot Locke. I'm the chapter team, and uh, I work at Eli Lilly as a senior scientist in technical services and manufacturing sciences. And now for membership zone, Ray Johnson. Is she? She's on, but she might be at work. Ray, you there? Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm here. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Ray Johnson. I'm vice president this year. I went to Columbia University, graduated with a degree in chemical engineering. I currently work at Biogen. And last year I was programs chair. Thanks, Ray. And I, I added the your high school just because I thought it was cool in uh, learning about you. I didn't, you know, know that you went to... Um, the early college. So I thought that was cool. Yeah. That's central. Yep. Thanks. Kelly, I, I think it's also good to mention that Ray put together that great video and she has a lot of creative skills that people don't know about. We, we try right. to keep it secret so she can work on our stuff. But anyway. <laughs> right. Ray, Ray put together the video that we played at the beginning. And yep. uh, she's done a lot of, a lot of different things for our chapter. So. Yeah great leader. And so Jamie is next and she had to work tonight, but Jamie is uh, fresh out of college, a uh, new graduate, uh, went to North Carolina A&T and uh, works at Merck now uh, as a associate uh, engineer. Uh, and so her uh, supervisor has her monitoring a process tonight. And so she was uh, unable to be here, but this is her first Nesby position uh, ever. And so we were glad that she took the opportunity to come aboard. For Finance Zone, we have Douglas Davis, our former vice president. You want to mute that? Hi, this is Douglas Davis, and I, I work at the UNC System Office, which is kind of the regulatory agency over all of the public colleges in um, North Carolina. And uh, as far as what the finance zone does, um, we, we pretty much make sure that um, RTP Nesby is compliant with the federal laws and regulations, uh, keep back your records, manage income and expenses, and try to find money for the chapter, um, such as grants and fundraisers, uh, that type of thing. So 
uh, seeing that we don't have a, a whole staff of accountants, we try to do that in the most efficient way possible. Um, and we're just trying to ensure a financially healthy RTP NSB. Oh yeah, and I'm a software engineer and uh, I primarily work on UNC Online, which is a, a website to help uh, students at public universities register for uh, courses at another public university. Thanks, Doug. And uh, in finance, um, we also have a Lionel Odorislan. Is he? And he um, he had another meeting at the same time, so I may not have made it tonight. Okay. But he's helping okay. out with the finances. He he knows a little more about accounting. Well, probably a lot more about accounting than, than I do. So he's helping out uh, as well this year. Okay. Well, Lionel, we met him through a, a PMP uh, certification course. Tony did a really good job networking and uh, was able to get Lionel to uh, come aboard. Uh, and uh, he works at Riven, mm -hmm. uh, which is in the RTP. And I put... Uh, times three because he went to the University of Montreal but that's where he has his MBA and his master's and his bachelor's and so, he's fluent in French too fluent in French like you Tony well <laughs> as you surprised me that you speak French <laughs> so communication zone we have Carlin Kearney Hi. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Hey. Um, hi, my name is Carlin Kearney. I, uh, I work as a project manager at STV, which is an architectural engineering consulting firm. So my background is civil engineering, um, where I received my undergraduate degree at Penn State. Uh, currently, I'm in a graduate program at Drexel University studying engineering management. And I am this year's chapter secretary for 2021-2022. So um, as comms on lead, I do hope to share later um, how uh, you can all help us as uh, in our communications to the membership and the work we share. So. Thanks, Carlin. And Carlin was our, uh, you were the... Professional development last year. Professional yes. development chair, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and she did a great job. So thank you for continuing. So Lindsay is actually, so Lindsay's my fiance. And so we've been dating since NC State uh, 2011. And um, she is uh, having some car trouble. Uh, oh, look at that smile, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. We were driving and uh, we hit a deer uh, in the RTP. Uh, if you're familiar with the area, mm -hmm. you know, it gets dark at nighttime and uh, a deer kind of jumped out and uh, hit her car. And so uh, she realized it might have some like radiator fluid leaking. And so she's, she's fine now, um, but that was like, I was on the phone with her like five minutes before uh, this meeting. So she's, she'll be fine, but she works at uh, Tethys and she studied chemical engineering at NC State um, with me. And you and don't feel up. like she didn't want you to leave and come over there? <laughs> I, she, she's, she's, she'll be here soon. So, okay. yeah, this but thanks, Tony. And so next we have Jonathan Winstead. Hey, good um, evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan Winstead. I'm going to be serving as the telecom chair for the chapter, the same position I held last year. I um, have undergraduate from ENT, a mechanical engineer, and several other degrees. And, Currently, I work for um, Collins Aerospace as a system engineer. So I'm happy to be here tonight. Thanks, John. 
and John was our uh, telecommunications chair last year. And his uh, family is a Nesby family. Uh, his son and I believe your daughter are in Nesby. And uh, his wife is in Nesby. And so we are very appreciative of their time and uh, dedication to Nesby. I want to just point out real quick, Elliot, that uh, Cher um, got member of the year in the chapter and she came in through Nesby Jr. So bring your kids along to Nesby Jr. If you have kids, nieces and nephews and cousins and so forth, uh, they definitely can um, learn alongside of you as a professional. So they, the Wednesdays have proven that. Thanks, Tony. For program zone, uh, leading the zone, we have Ayana Ferguson. Ayana, I don't think we can hear you. Yeah, she, I did see her in though. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, there we go. That was both on. Do too much technology, and I'm trying to. Um, um, program chair in mathematics. Uh, the audio is kind of going in and out, Ayana. Ooh, is it? It's kind of going. I don't know if it's an echo. It's going in and out a little bit. Okay, let me try one. Okay, how about now? Try it again. Okay, how about now? Yep. Okay. Uh, it looks like I'm muted, but I'm actually using just this computer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I knew you would figure it out. I knew you would figure it out. Sorry about that. But I was just saying, um, my background is in mathematics and statistics. Um, but I actually was a Nesby Junior member while I was at the School of Science and Math in Durham um, and recently got introduced to Tony. And I think as everybody says, Tony will just pull you into Nesby. Um, and so I actually participated last year as a volunteer um, and looking forward to continuing to be involved in um, assisting with the rest of the zone, being able to create some of the programs from some of the brilliant ideas that I've already heard. Um, I'm currently a data scientist at SAS Institute, and I also went to Wake Forest <laughs> University where I got my master's in business analytics. Thanks, Ayana. And uh, yeah, I thought I added hers as well because I think it's a, a great part of uh, Ayana's story. Uh, that she was in Nesby Jr. and went to, you know, a prestigious high school as well. So now we have Justin Ferguson. All right. Can you can you hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Great. So I'm Justin Ferguson, um, originally from Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, like Ayana, I was a part of Nesby Jr. as well at Dudley High School. Um, after Dudley, I went to NC State where I got my undergraduate degree in um, industrial engineering and then got my master's at Wake Forest in business analytics. I'm currently a solutions architect um, at Zora and um, this upcoming year I'll be serving as your PCI chair. Thanks, Justin. And I didn't know you were in Nesby Jr. as well. Yep. Uh, I was in Nesby Jr., uh, but we had like we just had a few meetings and we didn't even have a, you know, like an established chapter. And so I think it's really cool to see. Oh no. Sorry, my uh, my computer almost died. That would be uh, tragic. <laughs> but so uh, now we have uh, Dietrich, Bob, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if Dietrich I don't is think he's locked in. Okay, Dietrich uh, works and lives in Arizona, 
and so the uh, time zone is a little bit different. And so um, but he, he was here in North Carolina and he's our technical outreach community help chair. And uh, he was torch chair last year as well. Uh, this was actually, this was the first position I had in the professionals chapter. And um, he went to Southern University where I believe he did civil engineering and uh, works at, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce his company, but he works at Atchin and uh, Gartner and that's in Arizona. And so he's a civil engineer there. And so now we have Rich. Oh. Hey everybody, um, my name is Richard Gilliam. Uh, so I attended St. Augustine's University. I graduated in 2015 with a degree in biology. Um, I currently work at Eurofins as an automation engineer, um, working specifically with uh, robotics at our site. This year I will be serving as our college initiative chair. Uh, last year I served as the college initiative co-chair, um, but this year, you know, as the chair, I'll be working closely with our local colleges. And also I'm interested in connecting our professionals with our collegiate students, um, having um, mentors from our professionals to our college students and just, you know, building a bond and helping our college students as much as we can. So. Thanks, Richard. No and uh, Rich does a great, like he's impressed me uh, already this year and um, he's impressed me in like I guess a lot of professional uh, aspects as well actually when I was going through and making the these slides um, just like learning more about my executive board chapter um, I didn't well I should know this but everybody's really talented and there's so many things that you know I haven't haven't had to learn yet. Uh, so Caitlin, uh, she is also working nights at Pfizer uh, for I think the month of September. So she is not here tonight, uh, but Caitlin uh, went to uh, NC State and she did uh, biological engineering. And uh, Caitlin was actually in that same, same program, SDP, which is through the minority engineering programs. I used to tutor Caitlin in physics and like math. And so uh, she joined Nesby and uh, she, she didn't want to join her first few years out of college, but I uh, finally got her to join uh, the board this year. And so she'll be our professional development chair. And next we have Kirsten Ingram, who, uh, I'm not sure if Kirsten is here either. I don't see her logged in. I do see someone on the phone call. I don't know if that's her or not. I don't believe she's on. Okay. Well, Kirsten uh, is a healthcare expert. Um, she actually like came to us and was like very eager to be involved and wanted to join and help out, uh, even though her background isn't specifically in uh, engineering, but she is a uh, public health servant, you could say, uh, to the community and really cares and is passionate about that area. And so she's been a great asset to the chapter in terms of us having our programs related to the COVID-19 virus uh, and anything about communication related to that. And so she'll be having some pretty good programming uh, working with Ayana coming later this year. So that was the whole board uh, that we have. And so this is our administrative zone, uh, which is short for admin zone, uh, consists of all of the zone leads and we'll go ahead and get started with the oath of office. And so this is 
again, difficult to do when you're in the virtual uh, state of operations. Uh, but if everyone could please turn their cameras on that is here, that's on the executive board, we'll go ahead and do our oath. Okay, and I realized that I can't, okay, I, I can expand it. Um, we'll just, we'll go ahead and, still waiting for Ayana and John, but we'll go ahead and, go ahead and start. Um, so we don't have the whole echo going throughout the building. Uh, we'll go ahead and just say it uh, at your computer and repeat after me, and uh, we'll go through the uh, oath of office together, and uh, this will be uh, going into the executive board officially. So I, Elliot Locke, do solemnly pledge to uphold the goals mission and objectives of the National Society of Black Engineers. I pledge to perform my duties to the best of my abilities in the service of NSBE. I pledge to work in a concerted effort with the other executive board members to implement the national directives as NSBE moves towards achieving the goals and objectives of NSBE 25. I pledge to support the membership and their endeavors, and most importantly, to work to increase the number of culturally responsible Black engineers who excel academically, succeed professionally, and positively impact the community. So thank you. And uh, if everyone could just give a virtual, virtual round of applause, uh, for our, our executive board members, uh, congratulations. That's a great achievement and a great responsibility uh, taking on this level of uh, commitment to NSB. And so for those in the audience, I put this inverse pyramid because that's typically, you know, what how NSB is actually organized where the general body is the the top of the pyramid and you could say the national or maybe even board of like the actual front office of NSBE uh, and we support up from there to the general body members and so we need you all to be official members uh, official member means national and local uh, member uh, unless you're a member at large and so uh, we would appreciate your membership and thank you for continued membership over the years. And so I'm going to uh, skip the next slide and go to our, uh, I guess, speak our corporate spotlight speaker. Wonderful. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. Oh, I, I can't. I think you need to give me permission first. Okay. Can you now? Let me try. It's still, I still can't. Okay. Let me, I think I know, I have to make you a co-host. And I think you should be able to now. I, I can share it on my screen now. Okay. All 
All right. Okay. Can you all see my, my uh, presentation now? Yes. 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 All right. Well, I'm, I'm, first of all, thank you. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Kabod Al Khalil, and I'm a product engineer at John Deere. I'm um, also our John Deere Nesby chair, uh, and I'm honored to be here today because um, uh, I know a little bit about uh, the RTP chapter and what you all have done um, through uh, through Tony. So it's an honor to be here, and I've been been jotting down notes uh, as far as uh, good good uh, good things to do. So. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, about deer and just in general and some of the initiatives we're doing, and then I'll uh, dive into what um, John Deere Nesby is doing and what, what John Deere Nesby is. Uh, but before I get started, um, I want to talk about uh, my story uh, with with Nesby. So unfortunately, I did not. Uh, I wasn't in Nesby Junior, or I didn't even. I wasn't even even, even involved uh, with Nesby on uh, when I was in college. Um, and I say unfortunately because I'm sure I would have had a lot more opportunities had I, you know, attended the uh, recruiting conferences and all of those. Um, so, uh, but it was a particular event that happened about 10 years ago that led me to uh, be involved with Nesby. Um, I have, you'll see on the next slide, I have a twin brother uh, who is also an engineer and, and we went to school together and he also works at Deere. Um, and he attended an info session his senior year. Uh, where the where this lady by the name of Nicole McCown, um, she used to work for um, Rockwell, um, and uh, maybe some of you all might know her. Um, and uh, she helped him uh, at that info session up until like 10 p.m. Uh, that night before the career fair, with uh, uh, proofreading his resume and giving him tips and tricks uh, for the career fair. And what that helped him with is it resulted in him getting. Uh, many interviews and a few offers, uh, one of which was from, from John Deere. Uh, and then he was later instrumental in me getting a job at Deere. Uh, so that made me realize the, how powerful mentorship and how powerful um, just paying it forward is. And, and from that day on, I, I decided to, um, I guess, pay, pay it forward as well and, and, and be involved with Nesby. Um, so with that being said, uh, a little more about me. Um, as I said before, I'm a senior product engineer at John Deere. I, uh, uh, in the engines division, I um, joined Deere in 2013 as an EDP as part of our engineering development program, where you get to do a couple of rotations, uh, three rotations uh, for the over the two years. Um, I then joined our reman organization in 2017. Uh, and I've been there uh, since. And I'm, uh, in the next couple of weeks, I'll be joining our um, uh, John Deere Financial Organization as a data scientist. Um, but as far as Nesby is concerned, um, as soon as I joined Deere in 2013, I, I was one of the founding members of our Waterloo Cedar Falls Nesby chapter, professional chapter. Uh, and then I uh, became our conference planning lead, uh, uh, I think it was maybe four years ago. Uh, and in that, my role was to help Deere's presence at the Nesby conferences. Uh, I became vice chair, and uh, these, a couple of months ago, I became chair. Um, I'm a, an Iowa State grad, uh, did my undergrad in mechanical engineering, and I'm currently working on my master's uh, in system design and management at MIT. Um, I am, uh, uh, you can see a couple pictures here. Uh, some are some resume critique and mock interviews at Iowa State. Uh, the uh, lady that I'm sitting or standing next to was my first mentee at John Deere. Um, we were, we did a, a virtual mentorship before going virtual was a thing. It was a, maybe five, six years ago. Um, I'm also, uh, a, an avid sports junkie. So I, I, I've attended a couple NBA finals and, uh, there's a picture there in Barcelona and, um, originally also from Africa. So the top, top right corner picture is me and a couple of my sisters on, on some sand dunes, uh, in the Sahara desert. Uh, and I'm also a budding entrepreneur. I just recently started a, a, a coffee company. Uh, we specialize in, in spiced coffee. But now uh, enough about me, uh, um, let's talk about Deere. Um, so our company was founded by a, a blacksmith named John Deere in 1837. Uh, and so that makes us one of the oldest uh, operating companies in the US. Uh, we're not just one of the oldest companies, uh, we're also one of the biggest. And John Deere is a Fortune 500 company. Uh, in fact, we're one of the 100 largest companies in the United States. 
We have about 70,000 employees now, and uh, we have locations in more than 70 countries and, and facilities on every single continent uh, except Antarctica. Uh, we also manufacture nearly 100 distinct product uh, or distinct lines of equipment, which makes us one of the most iconic ag equipment manufacturers, uh, number one globally in forestry and number one in uh, road building equipment. Um, John Deere introduced a new strategy in 2020. Uh, so let, let's take a look at our strategy, our new operating model, uh, and it's three essential building blocks or focus areas. Uh, production systems. So that's a production system. It's how our, cus our customers get work done through a series of steps to produce their output. Uh, deep understanding of customers' production systems, including their cost, will help them save on expenses, increase productivity, uh, and become more profitable and successful at what they do. Uh, technology stack. So that's uh, developing the next generation of machines and services uh, requires us to build an easy to use technology stack made up of hardware and devices, embedded software, connectivity, data platforms and applications. Uh, we will design and manufacture smarter machines that are the best at their jobs, uh, collaborate with other equipment in our portfolio and get smarter over time. Our technology development efforts are driven by a single overarching goal, uh, which is to unlock customer e economic value. And finally, uh, life cycle solutions. When customers buy from John Deere, they expect and deserve to be supported the entire time they own that product. So uh, that's being, that is to say the full life cycle of the product. Uh, this is in increasingly important as our machines are more connected and technologically advanced. Uh, we are providing both reactive and proactive customer support, easy access to, to parts, value add services, and performance upgrades to our customers regardless of when they purchase their equipment. Uh, doing so maximizes the equipment value to customers and helps uh, them improve their businesses. We also benefit by growing our aftermarket business and further differentiating John Deere and our channel uh, in the marketplace. Slide. At John Deere, uh, we think of ourselves as, as disruptors who develop innovative products to meet our customer needs. And so what's a disruptor? Uh, in business, a disruptor is a company whose innovation creates, creates a new market. Uh, and as you, actually, as you can see there, that yellow dome shape uh, is uh, what we call Starfire. And that uh, basically uh, was, is, uh, allows us to geolocalize or locate uh, our tractors and allow for self-driving. And, and we've been in that business uh, way before, um, you know, like the Teslas of the world. Uh, we're just, um, uh, I guess, faced with different, uh, different environment, different challenges than uh, Tesla would be but we've been a leader in that, uh, in that space for, for a while. Um, today, our self-driving tractors are more capable than ever, more, more capable than even the best human drivers, which is a remarkable achievement. But even more remarkable achievements is uh, the precision farming that's just around the corner. Uh, and this is one thing that uh, uh, um, uh, is, is new, uh, is we've developed an, a system that uses high-speed photography and artificial intelligence to identify weeds. Uh, that will actually allow a farmer to spray herbicides only on weeds, potentially reducing herbicide costs by up to 95%. Uh, our Precision Act innovations permit farmers not only to be productive and profitable as they feed a growing population, but also safeguard the soil, water, and the air. And so that's a little bit about John Deere. I tried to highlight uh, some of the more interesting stuff uh, happening. Well, I think we all know that we're an iron company and we manufacture tractors. Um, but I think some of these new um, uh, AI and machine learning type of applications are uh, maybe not as widely known. And uh, that's one thing that I wanted to highlight. Um, the next thing that I want to go into is um, this uh, LEAP coalition. Um, so as I was putting these slides together, I wanted to make sure that I discussed initiatives that really stood out to me beyond the traditional DNI initiatives that all the other four, Fortune 500 companies have. Uh, and this specific one stood out to me for mainly two reasons. Uh, one is it's rooted at the intersection between DNI and us being a major player in the agriculture space. And two, I uh, believe it will have a major impact on, on, on black farmers. So before we discuss what LEAP is, uh, let's first define what AIRS uh, property is. Uh, so it refers to land that is jointly owned by descendants of someone who didn't have a legal, a legal will or didn't leave a legal will. 
uh, thereby leaving them without a clear title. Uh, and not having a will can have, um, I guess, an impact on uh, potentially or make the, 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 the property very vulnerable to, to land loss uh, and also prevents them from uh, potentially obtaining access to credit against that land and, and be able to, being able to fructify that land. And unfortunately, uh, since the 1900s, African-Americans lost about 80% of their land, uh, which is 12 million acres, due to structural racism and heirs property issues. Um, as a result, DEER has partnered with uh, the National Black Growers Council and the Third Good Marshall Fund to establish the LEAP Coalition in uh, 2020. And so LEAP stands for Legislation, ed Education, Advocacy, and Production Systems. And the goal is to help eliminate barriers uh, created by, by heirs property. Uh, and how are we doing that is we are uh, providing legal help to obtain titles, uh, providing donations and uh, help with succession planning. Uh, and the, we're also planning on creating a pipeline of attorneys that specialize in heirs property. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about this uh, specific initiative, um, uh, you can talk to me or you can uh, Google it. And I'm uh, sure there is a lot of literature out there on our website as well about it. Now on to, on to Nesby uh, and, and uh, specifically our John Deere Nesby. So uh, I think like I said, uh, at the beginning of this meeting, you uh, talked about Nesby's mission and I think we all know what it is. Um, and our, our uh, John Deere Nesby's mission is, is at the intersection of the Nesby mission and our John Deere uh, DNI goals. Uh, and it's to attract, develop and retain top black talent by being active participants in all phases of the pipeline. And I think tangibly what this results into is helping Nesby achieve their goal of graduating 10,000 engineers annually by 2025. And I believe you, mentioned, you also mentioned that, Elliot, uh, uh, early on in your, in your presentation. And so now, how do we execute that mission? Um, and the, the, the answer is partially in this vision board uh, where I highlight only some of the initiatives that we're working on. Uh, if you look up top, we have pre-college, college, and professional. And I, I, we also have three pillars across those. Uh, and if we use the Nesby torch as a metaphor, um, our goal is to increase or to create a STEM spark uh, pre-college, to turn that into a flame in the college ranks and to keep fanning that flame uh, when they reach the professional ranks. Uh, and again, this is only a snapshot of our vision board uh, with a few initiatives uh, that I'm gonna highlight. Um, the first one is the Seed Camp. Uh, so we sponsored a free three week summer engineering program that's targeting uh, third through fifth graders that's organized by Nesby. Uh, it was virtual this year. Uh, and this year they focused on drones, robotics and coding. And uh, the goal with this is we need to get these kids interested in STEM early on. Uh, we plan on having a seat camp in, in Des Moines in the summer of 2022. And uh, we're really, really excited about that. Um, the second piece is recruiting. Um, so we've been recruiting at Nesby conferences since 2001, uh, with a record number of recruiters attending the 2018 conference in Detroit. Uh, we have we had about 55 recruiters, uh, and uh, just a, lo a little plug: uh, we'll be attending the Region Five Nesby conference, uh, which will be uh, I think November 4th through the 6th. And I know y'all are Region Two, um, and we have recru recruited in Region Two in the past as well. Uh, um, and I had the chance to visit the North Carolina a and campus uh, a few years back. Um, one thing that, uh, that actually Tony is leading uh, are the HBCU partnerships, right? So what's even better than recruiting is uh, developing organic relationships with these, uh, with these schools. Uh, we're mainly looking at three schools at the moment um, and exploring partnerships with them in areas that, they, in areas, of, areas of expertise, but also in areas that um, we need help. Uh, to have a win-win relationship uh, and hopefully develop a pipeline into, into DEER. Um, once these interns uh, come into DEER, we also uh, have a mentorship program for all of our interns. Uh, and what we do is we pair every single intern with a John Deere, every single Nesby, John Deere Nesby intern with a John Deere full-time employee uh, to help them navigate their internship and help them um, with uh, any questions that they might have, help them with final presentations, job shadowing opportunities. Um, and, and, and we've seen uh, it, it pay dividends and, and we've seen um, uh, our offer rates 
um, skyrocket and, and be up up in the in the ninety percent, uh, which is which is uh, really awesome to see. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention was um, we're planning on expanding now that uh, uh, mentorship to, to full time employees, um, and and uh, I'm sure it will also pay dividends and and uh, um, as it did with the with the interns. Um, and this is my my last slide. Um, as I mentioned before, we, we attended our first NSB conference in 2001. Um, I, I wasn't there, obviously, but uh, some of the people that were there um, told me that they, you know, they, it was only five of them. Five of them, they didn't have carpet when they were recruiting, and things were were um, uh, different back then. And and uh, my first one that I attended, I believe, was in 2014, and in, in I think in Nashville, and, and things were were way different. And and um, I think we're uh, definitely trending in the right direction, um, and uh, it's exciting. It's exciting to see. Um, we uh, became a BCA partner in 2012, and we received uh, the Exceptional Corporate Partner Award in 2018. And as I mentioned before, we uh, also um, were a sponsor of Seek in uh, uh, this past this past summer. Um, our professional chapters, uh, namely the Waterloo Cedar Falls uh, professional chapter, the Quad Cities. Uh, the RTP and the Augusta one uh, have played a major role in us um, achieving these goals. Um, and, uh, and we've been learning a lot having had a Tony as part of your group and you all having one uh, national chapter of the year. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to uh, use you all as a, as a blueprint and, and um, hopefully disseminate those um, lessons learned across uh, all the other chapters as well. So uh, I, you all are, uh, I think, a great example, and I'm, I'm excited to, to be here to speak with you all today. So uh, that, that kind of concludes my uh, presentation. And at the moment, if you have any questions, um, please go ahead and, and ask them, and I'll do my best to answer them. I have a question. Um, sure. This is Marshall. Um, Hi, Marshall. First, could you uh, pronounce your first name again, please? I just don't want to. Sure. Uh, it's, it's Kaboud. Kaboud. Yeah. Thank you. And You're second, um, I used to live in Augusta. Okay. Uh, maybe you or Tony can answer. I'm very surprised to see that that chapter is inactive. Yep. Can you tell me what happened? And how could we prevent that from happening in RTP with John Deere being such a major uh, sponsor? I can chime in on it if you want me to. Sure, Please. go ahead, Tony. So, um, and unfortunately, chapter health is a big concern for professional chapters across the board. So just want to preface that. Um, having a sustainability plan and then also um, professional chapters are nonprofit organizations. I know we really focus on, you know, the NSB brand, which is what our, our purpose, but you really have to learn how to operate a nonprofit. And quite a few of us learned that the hard way. We're, we're actually in the process of ensuring our sustainability as well. And I would say um, that along with having sustainability and then just people being able to have uh, governance development, uh, that would help, would have helped that. I have been in touch with some individuals to see what they could do to kind of um, rekindle. They do have a very active Nesby Jr chapter, I want to say it's in South Carolina. So uh, my thought and my strategy is to let the Nesby Virginia chapter, chapter enable the professional chapter. I've seen that happen, you know, quite a bit. And it may be a partnership that will help them um, thrive better together there. It also helps to have a couple of pillar companies in the area to help sustain um, a critical mass. Thank you, um, and thank you, uh, Kabuda, for that presentation. Um, very, very surprising, again, just to take those lessons learned so that we continue to be a healthy chapter. And thank you. Kabuda, right. I was going to also mention real quick sure. that we will um, – that in the past, uh, we've sponsored a scholarship that uh, we had two recipients through our chapter. Um, well, it was sponsored to collegiate students, but but they applied to RTP 
um, NSBE. So that is another avenue that John Deere has um, helped those chapters out with as well through scholarships. Yeah. And I, I believe the plan is to do the same thing this year as well. Right, regional scholarships. Yeah. And a question that I had, well, first I wanna say thank you. Uh, I thought your presentation was great. Thank you. And uh, I, uh, I actually, it's no, no offense. It's just, I wasn't a, I thought uh, when Tony had mentioned it that uh, a representative was coming, I just thought it was going to be um, like a, you know, just like a brief overview. And that was great because um, a lot of times companies will reach out to us and they want to know more about how they can do programming or do something with NSB to primarily increase recruiting efforts, diversity efforts. And I really appreciate what uh, John Deere does in terms of actually being involved in the programming and initiatives and mission that Nesby has. And so it goes a long ways and shows, you know, your success as an organization is because you all are actively giving back and actively involved with the organization beyond just a career fair. And so it was, nice to see and um kind of like my question is kind of um what inspired you to go to MIT and then kind of also can you tell me kind of of some of your experiences in terms of uh embracing change uh as I know you've like had to travel a lot and um, probably have some international experiences. So I just wanted to know that as a um, professional. Sure, so the, the, the first question was? Um, <laughs> see that briefly, I, f I forgot my own, my own question. What inspired you to go to MIT? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so uh, um, that's like an awesome question. So the, the, the program that, that I'm in is between their school of, uh, their business school, like Sloan School of Management and their engineering school. And um, to me, I, I think I'm at a point in my career where I think I kind of wanted, 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 wanted both, wanted to be able to take classes in their uh, business school, but also in their um, engineering school. Um, the program is also uh, geared towards like system thinking. So it's a mixture of uh, system architecture, uh, system engineering and program management. And, and, and in my opinion, I think moving forward, system thinking is going to be critical in all of the, all of these companies' successes because um, like a vacuum cleaner now, right, collects data and sends data to the cloud, right? So th there are a lot, a lot of moving parts, a lot of interfaces. How do you uh, understand that uh, that product as a as a whole, right? And uh, to me, as you, as you we tackle more and more complex systems. I think having that system thinking, I think, will be critical. Um, so, and it's also very interdisciplinary. Uh, it's it wasn't it's not product engineering per se. Uh, that system thinking can, can apply to organization, to legislation, to like there's a medical doctor in, in my uh, uh, class. Um, so I think that's kind of what what attracted me uh, to uh, to that program. Can I also add to um, everyone may remember Jeffrey Philippi. Jeffrey was a systems engineer. I don't know if he was in that same program, Kabu, but I know he went to MIT as well. Yeah, I, like I know him. I, I just, yeah, I don't know if he was in the same program. And and your second question was embracing change. Yeah, um, just because I yeah. noticed like your photo. Yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah, that's 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 like a great question, and 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 um, so I I was I guess maybe a little bit more. Uh, I was born in the states, uh, so in Iowa. And then I, I I lived my first seven years in Iowa. I lived my my parents are from Chad, so Central Africa. I lived in Chad for five years. Then I went lived in West Africa and Niger for seven years. I lived in France for two years, and then came back to the states. Um, and then I've been li living in Iowa uh, since then. But um, I don't know. I think I think like short like the the first thing that comes to mind is I have a twin, and, and we've kind of been moving like together. So yeah, at least like one familiar person, right? <laughs> that I think that that helps kind of anchor uh, anchor all all that, um, but, but but yeah I think just from my upbringing having to have 
to, to move from location to location and make new friends, I think made made it a lot easier to um, adapt to change. Just growing up, it was part of who I am, and um, had to learn a couple a couple new languages each time, a uh, new culture, um, and and yeah. So I think I think it, it made me um, it made it easier for me to adapt to to change. So also just being a minority, right? Like you you just have to <laughs> you have to. Uh, um, uh, you're not like so when I was in, in Africa I was part of the majority uh, being being black but then when I went to France I was the only person the only black person in my in my class so then you gotta things shift right so it's being an engineer right we're, we're oftentimes the only few <laughs> so yeah. well I, I appreciate that uh, uh, that was actually I always ask people that question because I feel like change and embracing change is that's something that makes people successful and so i always want to know what's their strategy and um experiences and so i appreciate you for for sharing and um i appreciate you for coming out tonight and giving us uh the john deere spotlight and we're looking forward to working more with john deere and um, being closely involved and uh, staying in contact with you as well. And so thank you for your time tonight. For sure. Thank, thank you, Elliot. And thank you all. Uh, and thank, thank you, Tony, for, for the opportunity. Uh, and uh, yeah, if anyone wants to link up, um, have a LinkedIn and I'll be more than happy to chat. I'll, I'll be sending you an invite. <laughs> Sounds good. Don't, don't send it to my twin, though. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's happened a few times. <laughs> It's right. just to like mention one thing. I do think that that our national chair last year uh, had a twin sister, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually was wondering if I sent the uh, invite to the, the wrong one. <laughs> but all right. Well, thank you again, and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Bye. Let me just share my screen. And um, so now uh, we will go into our next speaker. Sorry. And I will just do, do my, I have a, introduction for you, Mr. Smith, uh, that I'll just uh, read. And so Ms. Mr. George A. Smith is a Chicago native. He attended Wacker and Fernwood Elementary Schools and is a graduate of Lindbaum High School. At Lindbaum, Mr. Smith was a member of the Junior Engineers Technical Society, JETS, uh, served as president of the Honor Society and earned Scholastic as emblem. Uh, George Smith and his closest friends uh, were accepted into Purdue University School of Engineering. And in 1971, George Smith received one of the first awards presented by our founding organization. Oh, sorry, I'm reading a, a copy. Uh, and so George Smith is an alum of the Scholarship Award Program for the Chicago Engineers Club. While at Purdue, Mr. Smith studied electrical engineering. Uh, George Smith was part of a group at Purdue named the Chicago Six, who were the first uh, founders of NSBE, the uh, NSBE as we know it. Those uh, Chicago Six were Edward Barnett, Fred Cooper, author Barn, Bond, sorry, and uh, Mr. Smith. And I apologize, Mr. Smith. This uh, biography does not have the entire uh, Chicago Six list in it. Um, so I apologize about that. That's okay, uh, Elliot. But um, from the start, the uh, Society of Black Engineers, uh, the SB mission was to help minority students adapt to the college environment, adjust to the rigors of engineering, and develop the professional skills required in the workplace. 
George Smith designed the group's logo, edited the newsletter, and served on the executive planning committee. Uh, the Chicago Six recognized the nationwide need for their society. So in 1975, with the support of the leadership of Purdue University, Professor Arthur Bond and corporate sponsors, they established the National Society of Black Engineers, NSBE. Mr. Smith led one of the six regional meetings at the first national conference 45 years later, and probably more at this point, <laughs> being that this was uh, written a little while ago, George Smith is actively involved in helping the, to fulfill the Nesby mission, hence uh, being here tonight. Uh, since its inception, Nesby has grown from fewer than 200 founding conference attendees uh, representing 39 founding college chapters to over 16,000 members and over 500 chapters worldwide. After earning an electrical engineering degree from Purdue, uh, Mr. Smith joined General Electric and in 1978, Hewlett Packard. During his HP career, George won a number of awards, including the HP President's Club Award, this prestigious award was personally presented to him by the company's founder, founders Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard. In 1992, George started a business a process consulting for, firm and authored two business improvement books published by the American Society for Quality. Mr. Smith retired in 2015. Today, he's an active volunteer with a number of organizations, including Nesby Jr., Nesby, the Nesby Professionals, Project Sincere, uh, MOCCHA, which is Men of Color Connected for Higher Achievement, PTA Men of Brookdale, Calvary Christian Church, Westside Four, and the Chicago Engineers Foundation where he is a student outreach volunteer and member of the Associate Council. So please give um, a virtual round of applause and a welcome to our keynote speaker, George A. Smith. Thank you so much, Elliot. Uh, were you able to uh, share my presentation? Yes, and uh, I just have to stop share and then while he's doing that, I'll uh, just say that I've enjoyed participating in this meeting. Uh, it's great to see so many active members of your chapter. Great to see you know, new leadership stepping up for 2021-2022. And um, I really enjoyed uh, and appreciate, Kaboot, uh, your presentation, bringing uh, corporate America uh, and sharing what you're doing with, uh, with John Deere, with your colleagues. Uh, you know, you're, you're exercising the power of Nesby whenever you do that. Um, and I just uh, really enjoy seeing how uh, Nesby is being promoted within John Deere. Um, as Kaboot said, one of the largest corporations in America. So, uh, you know, those efforts will pay off. The dividends will come uh, you know, in the form of changed lives. Young people who, you know, get scholarships from John Deere or you know, see role models, engineers that work for John Deere, uh, that, you know, uh, and, and they'll be able to say, I want to be like her. I want to be like him. You know, and you guys won't even realize that you've inspired these people. You know, they'll, you know, they may or may not show up in a, in a Nesby meeting 10 years down the road, but trust me, uh, that's, that's, that's really uh, the power of this organization. 
Okay, so there's my uh, presentation. Uh, Tony asked me uh, to speak on the importance of NSB. I'm not going to do anything with my uh, with my bio because you all have already heard all of that. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so you know when I thought about this question, what is the importance of Nesby? My first thought was, well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on who asks. Uh, it depends on who is the audience. Who you know? Who are your sharing information with and that's really important whenever we have a message because if we share benefits that are uh, benefits to members with someone from corporate america then corporate america is not going to see and not going to perceive those benefits and so i just have uh, a list of uh, you know of course nesby member categories uh, but as well as nesby allies and trust me the government is an ally and they have been an ally from the very beginning uh, and you know they're not none of these groups do anything out of the goodness of their heart okay they do it because there's something in it for them and the government understands that we have to have engineers of all hues and for this to be a solid economy, national economy. The corporate America, you know, is even though they don't broadcast it to all of their mainstream employees, the corporate America knows good and well uh, that they need uh, engineers of every hue to maintain and improve their profit margins. Uh, the, you know, the, the point I have is that you know, if you want to sell Nesby, you want to sell the benefits that are relevant to that particular, uh, to whoever is your audience. You know, educators, think about it. Uh, Purdue University is one of the greatest uh, education institutions in the, in the United States. They are proud to say that Nesby was founded on their yard. Okay, that, that reflects very well on Purdue University. And you know, from what I've learned, not just from what I saw, but from what I've learned in addition uh, about Purdue's role, they were there in the very in, in the inception of the whole concept of increasing the minority engineering population in America. You know, for us uh, Black Americans, you know, really, uh, it, you know, there's, there's no mystery here. It's a way uh, for students, no matter what their, uh, no matter what their, no matter what income background they grew up in, uh, it's, it's a way for them to enter the middle class immediately after uh, college graduation, which could be four years of you know, with all these AP classes, it could be three years after they come out of high school now. Um, and, you know, and that, uh, is, that is the biggest gap that we have uh, as a race. So Nesby, uh, create, you know, represents an opportunity that really is unmatched uh, in terms of uh, getting a professional degree early in your life. And when you get an engineering degree, you have respect. That's the other intangible. You have respect for the rest of your life, no matter what happens, no matter what you, you know, if you change, uh, you know, uh, industries, change professions. Whenever someone says, I have an engineering degree, I have, a, you know, a technology degree, you get respect. Uh, and, you know, that's one of the things that has been lacking for our people as well. You know. uh, and so who are we doing this for? We're doing it uh, for students to help us grow our numbers. We have to reach back. That's really uh, what, you know, what we are trying to do. When the Society of Black Engineers was established at 
Purdue University, there were uh, there were seniors in engineering that were reaching back to freshmen, and that just happened to be uh, 50 years ago. 50 years ago, this month, I was a freshman. My crew was we were all freshmen at Purdue University. I had no idea about what engineering was. I had never met an engineer. I talked to my other guys. I had no. I had never met one. They had never met one. Even though I got that award from the Chicago Engineers uh, Club, I was actually invited to a luncheon that, for whatever reason, I wasn't able to attend. I would have, you know, met a whole room full of engineers had I gone to that. Uh, but you know, in, in, you know, until the day I set foot on Purdue's campus as a freshman, I had never met an engineer of any color, of any race in my life. So uh, you know, it's it was fitting that the first one that I met was a black engineer, who became uh, you know our academic advisor. And I, you know, at that point, I really didn't realize the significance of his contributions. I mean, I, what I say is, we were in what I call a student bubble, and in the student bubble, you focus on you know just passing your classes, you know, um, you know, and as the uh, Society of Black Engineers began to form, you know, we were just trying to get mentorship and get through those first couple of years. Uh, but uh, it, it just was a, it represented a tremendous opportunity. You know, at that time, uh, there, you know, there wasn't a network of people. You know, as far as we were concerned, we could have been, uh, there, were, there were 28 uh, uh, engineering students. We could have been the only engineering students on the, Black engineering students on the face of the earth. Okay, there was no networking whatsoever. Uh, and so that's part of what Mesby represents. Um, and, you know, I appreciate Kabu's comments about having a twin brother and having that twin brother, you know, looking out for you and, you know, and helping you network and, you know, getting the job first and then. Uh, providing uh, the uh, creating the opportunity for for you Kabu to get the interview for a job that you, you, know, you later accepted. I think you mentioned that you had more than one opportunity, and you know you, you accepted the one that John did. So that's just terrific. You know now we have thousands of professionals that can cross pollinate. You know however many times a year that you guys meet. Um, so that's, uh, you know, a bit of a detailed uh, you know, answer to the question. The short answer, the last line here, the short answer is, you know, Nesby is important because America needs us. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, I thought it would be important to share with you how this whole party got started to begin with. You know, just look at the binder of this book. Uh, this book was published in 1974. This book has been opened and closed so many times that the pages will literally fall out if they're not held together uh, by uh, a, a paper clip. Uh, but this represents this book basically documents the beginning of our history. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that we have allies, the National Academy of Engineering uh, and the Sloan Foundation. That for anybody working in the auto industry, Alfred P. Sloan was the, uh, he was the big CEO of uh, General Motors. And he was the one that really launched them into uh, prominence. And, you know, they became bigger than Ford Motor Company, they, you know, they followed the Model T and knocked Ford for a loop in the very beginning. But this, so this guy was very wealthy. When he retired, he left a bundle of cash 
uh, with the Sloan Foundation and uh, their, their goal was to uh, improve life in America. You know? And so they recognized that we have this engineering deficit, this education deficit among minorities in America. And so this book was a call out to the National Academy of Engineering who's responsible for advising the government on all things engineering. This book was a, a call out to them, uh, uh, you know, letting them know the Sloan Foundation was aware that they had a problem. And, you know, it was a call out to them to uh, begin to fix that problem. So I thought it was interesting. Let's go to the next slide. I thought it was interesting that this whole initiative is coincidental with the birth of Nesby. Uh, so what I want people to understand is, yes, Nesby started in 1975. This book was published in 1974, okay? And uh, 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 there was a commission on expanding minority opportunities in engineering um, that uh, really took the uh, bull by the horns and, and led this and set expectations. Um, and uh, this whole process started in 1972. They established a minority engineering education effort committee. Uh, they established the Engineers Council for Professional Development uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, and let's go scroll up to the next slide. And uh, the National Academy of Engineering held a conference on May, uh, between May 6th and 8th in 1973. And the bottom line is they had over 250 uh, leaders, American leaders from government, corporations, uh, civil rights leaders, uh, as well as educational institutions. And they all made a, a commitment to try to increase uh, the number tenfold. So it's important for you to understand there were 400 to 500 engineers graduating every year in 1971, 1972. And they said, by the end of the decade, we need to get to 5,000. Now, uh, you know, Tony, anybody on, on how many, how many black engineer graduates do we have today? Today? Yeah. 50 Ooh. years later. I'm going to say not day. enough. Well, um, <laughs> I heard a number about 5,000. Okay. <laughs> now we have this goal to get to 10,000 by 2025, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't think we made a lot 000. of strides. So yeah. instead of by the end of the decade, that would have been 1979. It mm -hmm. took us 50 years to get to 5,000. You know, and to me, that's not acceptable. Right. Uh, you know, we have not, we have come so far. Uh, we have, you know, wonderful, um, you know, middle class among the, uh, the Nesby, uh, you know, members. But just look at the status of the majority of African Americans in this country. You know, it's not good enough. So, so everything we've done so far is great. We have a, a much larger army uh, of people to, uh, you know, to, to make the next 50 years look better. Uh, but we need to be more aggressive, uh, you know, and uh, I, wanna, I wanna scroll forward, scroll forward, and I'll, uh, I'll share with you what I think. You know, this is just an article, uh, you know, that talks about in the fine print, talks about the importance of STEM uh, to our nation, uh, past, present, and future. Let's scroll to the next page. Uh, you know, this is the real nitty gritty uh, of it. Uh, we need to improve the American economy. We need to improve the black economy. 
there are 60, 67% of US jobs will be influenced by STEM. There will be some aspect of these jobs that uh, you know, require STEM related skills. So just think about that. You know, and this message has not been driven home uh, to the majority of our people. I mean, I can just look in within my own family, you know, no matter how many Facebook posts I, you know, send out, you know, I know that there are people in my own family who don't get it yet, okay? You know, in this economy that our kids, our, our, our grandkids and grandnieces and nephews that they are going to enter, it's not going to be grandma and grandpa's economy, okay? So uh, they're going to be shut out if they don't develop quantitative skills, it's, it's, you know, it really is that simple. So that's why this is so important. Okay, let's scroll to the next. Uh, you know, and so how do we get there? Is STEM education. Now, you see, uh, the, you know, in the picture, they have, you know, they don't have any black kids in there, right? You know, fortunately, they have a, a, a young lady. They have some ladies in there, right? But they don't have any black folks in this in this picture. Uh, so, whoever decided to use that particular picture, they weren't thinking about us. Okay, so uh, you know, we are going to have to uh, we're going to have to take the initiative to make sure our kids are educated. And so, go scroll to the next. Now, uh, you know, the question is, why haven't we, uh, you know, it, it seems to be that we're not motivated. Um, not enough of us are motivated. And many of you, because you're professionals, you've already seen this mass low hierarchy of needs. Well, this is what motivates people. And the lower level leads, physiological leads, needs, safety, you know, belonging, those have to be satisfied first, you know, and I can just think back to my own education. I had great role models in my household. You know, both of my parents were HBCU grads. So I, you know, I always knew I was going to college, but you, our kids are not necessarily getting that same type of nurturing from the school systems that they're in. And I'll just tell you, um, I, no teacher ever smiled at me until I was in fifth grade. That was the first time that a teacher smiled at me. You know, and I'm going to tell you this right now. That was the day that I became a, not just a good student. I became a great student in fifth grade when when uh, Mrs. When I wish I I hope I, I wish I could find her you know, her relatives and, you know, just tell them what a great woman this lady was. And, and I was trying to be a wise guy when that happened, because she asked a question and I just shouted out Montana, you know, figuring everybody would laugh because of, you know, what I was saying was going to, you know, I thought it was a preposterous answer. It was the correct answer. And she looked at me, she said, that was Great, George. You know, that's right, George, <laughs> with a big smile on her face. I'm telling you, that makes a difference. You know, in, in my retired life, I, I, I help out in Sunday school, uh, at least before the pandemic. You know, I had done it for about four or five years before the, the pandemic, you know, and I'm with first graders. And I always made sure that I gave every one of those kids that came in the door a big smile. If I didn't do anything else, you know, they had a big smile. They saw a big smile from me every Sunday. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay, so this is where Nesby uh, comes into play. Uh, the, the problems that we have in our community are psychosocial. Okay, the, the, the chains of slavery have been off, okay? But there are mental chains that still exist in our community. And uh, so we have to be uh, very aware that 
we have to build up uh, the self-esteem of uh, students who don't necessarily get it from home uh, and, and may not get it from school. But as you just go around that circle, starting at the top from early childhood, uh, you see what that uh, development, that so cycle, social development curve looks like. Uh, you know, and, and because uh, I'm a grandfather, my grandson's 11 years old now, but you know, I retired by the same time that he got started his education. So, and, and our daughter always lived within minutes of us. So I have seen every homework paper that he ever had up until the pandemic. You know, and I know, uh, you know, how he thinks. I've seen how his, you know, his uh, uh, psychological development has, uh, you know, has come to be, you know, and we've made, uh, you know, particular efforts to make sure that we shore up uh, and, you know, and help this kid nav navigate this landscape. Uh, uh, now, we live in a, you know, a nice, uh, um, suburb of Chicago, one of the communities that's been listed as a top 50 community in America to raise kids and all that type of stuff. But you don't, you don't have a black kid, you know, does not have the same type of support in that school. Uh, you know, uh, they didn't, they didn't allow him into, uh, into advanced math after second grade. So I said, oh, oh, that'll never do. So I became his advocate. We started, uh, uh, you know, we started tutoring. And over the course of that summer, we went through between second and third grade. We went through not only the third grade math curriculum, but we went through the, the fourth grade math curriculum too. Because, you know, I said, when my grandson hits it, okay, he's going to be ready to compete with everybody in that room. So even though, you know, he, he, he was ready, he knew everything in third grade. He still didn't have an advocate. Our daughter had to, you know, continue to ask them to move him into advanced math uh, for each, you know, the rest of third grade and into fourth grade. And finally, by the, you know, mid fourth grade, they moved him in, okay? Uh, and so what's happening psychologically is the kids who don't be, get put into these advanced math classes, they think of the other kids as smarter, okay? The other kids are not smarter, but this is what's happening psychologically. They're thinking the other kids are smarter because they're in the advanced math. So anyway, you know, once our, our grandson uh, hit uh, by halfway through fourth grade, the teacher said he was done with the assignment before she finished giving the instruction, <laughs> okay? So it was time to move him up. Uh, you know, so we need, you know, there's every student that gets accepted to engineering school, every student has the wherewithal to graduate. And so anytime we lose someone, it's because of uh, that they're not getting the psychosocial nurturing, okay? Uh, you know, and that's what we had. Uh, we were a, a self-enclosed, self-help group, the Chicago Six. You know, we had been together. Uh, you know, some of us, some of these guys in, in my group had been together in first, second, and third grade. You know, I knew El Ed Coleman in sixth grade. And all of us knew each other by 14 years old, freshman in, in, in high school. So we were our own support group. And, uh, you know, and the spirit that I see within Nesby now is the same spirit. You know, we were like a little a little family unit, and I see that now. We have, you know, we have family units throughout Nesby, uh, and that's really the first thing that people talk about. Uh, you know, I couldn't have gone through, I couldn't have made it through engineering school with, if it weren't for Nesby, okay? Uh, and I will tell you this, I wouldn't have been able to make it through engineering school were it not for the Society of Black Engineers. It's that important. Okay, next slide. And I think uh, I may be out of time already. I get on a roll. And <laughs> uh, 
I don't I don't know when I put this together, but uh, you know, I was thinking about what is Nesby. Nesby is a co-ed fratority. You get it? Uh, in which brothers, sisters, advisors, mentors, and sponsors help you to find your place in life. It's not just an education. Get an engineering degree. Get paid. Okay. You know, you guys get paid. I know it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and get on a professional fast track. You know, it's the fastest way to get in, to become professionals to get an engineering degree. You know, I tell everyone uh, who wants to be a doctor or a lawyer, get that engineering degree first. You don't know if you'll get accepted to law school. You don't know if you'll get accepted to medical school, but you will be a professional after four years if you get that engineering degree first. Uh, my wife is a medical doctor and she says, you know, if she had known about it, she would have studied uh, biomedical engineering herself, okay? Uh, she'd studied microbiology uh, and then climb to the mountaintop uh, and then lift your family and your community. Now, I mentioned in the beginning that um, uh, we are role models, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, we are role models. And I've seen this happen within my own family that my wife and I, the 25th wedding anniversary, um, we had our friends and, and you know, family members say a few words uh, on our behalf. My cousin, first cousin, she's about seven years younger than me. She stood up there, uh, you know, and she said, well, I, I, I'm fo I followed my cousin. And they called me Tony because my dad's name was George, too. I followed my cousin, Tony. You know, she went to the same high school. She went to the same college. She majored in engineering. She became a, 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 a Nesby officer, okay? And, you know, she went beyond me because she got an MBA uh, after that from Notre Dame. But so I, the point is, 25 years in to our marriage, I had no idea. I just thought it was always a coincidence that uh, my cousin was going to the, <laughs> the same schools that I went to. I made her decision process really easy. And, you know, so, you know, I thank, I thank God for uh, being that, you know, that shining light for her. And uh, I'll just say that uh, her daughter uh, was named by Forbes as one of the uh, top contributors, influencers, that's the term they use, for social media. She's, a, you know, an editor of a, uh, uh, a news outlet that interviews uh, and writes stories about the large companies that are involved in, you know, data management, um, you know, in, in this country. And so that's just amazing to me. You know, she, she wrote one of the first books on Twitter. <laughs> you know, I turn on PBS news channel and you know she's only about 25 years old and she's sitting next to a professor from Northwestern and they're both talking about the, they're both considered experts okay so this is I mean you know this is the uh, this is the potential uh, that uh, this type of education provides for us uh, Tony knows that you know, what I do primarily is I talk about black inventors because I found that kids are really excited about you know, these stories, not just the invention itself, but you know, the path, the people that invented these things. I'm not gonna uh, go any further because it, you know, if I start down that path, it would be a long night. But I appreciate you all inviting me uh, I just am so proud of everything that you've done and everything that you've done. You're going to do more than me because, see, I'm not going to be here 50 years from now, okay? You will. So, uh, you know, you're the ones who are going to fan the flames of the torch. Did I get that right, Kaboot? <laughs>
So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. And everyone, please do virtual claps, give real claps, uh, give a round of applause for Mr. Smith. And uh, high thank you. you. High five to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> We really appreciate having you come to our meeting and for imparting wisdom uh, to our chapter uh, and also inspiration as well. Uh, I think for myself, hearing you speak, uh, it's actually my first time. I know Tony has uh, met you before, uh, but it's like an honor for me because, um, you know, I've, I, I have my... I think eight year, eight years in SB leadership this year uh, started in 2013 at NC State as PCI chair and um, never stopped since. And um, I just really appreciate, you know, being able to, to meet you, to hear from you. And uh, it's an honor to have you talk to our chapter. So thank you so much. Well, if you only knew how much of a fan I am of you, okay? It, you know, because I consider it an honor. You know, just think about it. I get to meet, you know, with close to 30 young Black engineers, okay? Most other people in my peer group, you know, they don't get this perspective that I get. You know, they get you know, what they say on CNN and Fox, and it's all negative, okay? They don't understand that we have an infrastructure that is very positive, you know, and have, you know, we've, we've come a long way and we are definitely uh, going to reach that mountaintop Dr. King talked about. It's just gonna take longer than I had hoped. I agree. And um, I did want to ask, because um, uh, you, you still have time, uh, uh, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Smith? I have some, but I'm going to hold back because I know I can talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a, a question and I have a reputation of asking questions. Uh, it is an honor, power. sir. It is an honor, an honor. I can say I have uh, listened to the presentation of a Hall of Famer. You are <laughs> a Hall of Famer. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, this is not a rhetorical question, but um, I want to ask, when you were on campus, a part of the Chicago Six, what were the white students like? when they got word that you were forming this black group and how was their response and how did you all overcome that? I can't imagine in those times um, that they opened you, opened their arms to embrace a black engineering group. Well, uh, socially, um, you know, I was in the black student bubble, okay? Socially, I was in that bubble. Um, uh, the only time that I really had a, a white associate was if I had a lab partner. You know, and all of our conversations were focused on the work. And so there wasn't really, you know, any dialogue like that. Um, so what you have to understand is that we had segregation um, that was actually legal for most of the time that I was growing up, okay? So, you know, Black kids, uh, they weren't trying to mix in socially, okay? Uh, we were just kind of trying to, you know, do what we came there for get that education, get that degree, get that job. Um, now, uh, you know, so the white students were probably, um, 
uh, I don't know what the, the best word, standoffish, apprehensive. Um, the the only uh, there was a positive encounter that I had, uh, but the students that that uh, I was talking to, they had no idea about the Society of Black Engineers. This was a new organization. This organization didn't have any clout, didn't have any profile. You know, none of my classmates knew anything about the Society of Black Engineers. The only the only ones who did were the Society of Women Engineers. Uh, and that was because the academic advisors of both the Society of Women Engineers and the Society of Black Engineers um, were colleagues. And, you know, Dr. Bond actually benchmarked the Society of Women Engineers model. Because I don't know if, you know, you know this, but the Society of Women Engineers was a national organization by 1955, 20 years before the Society of Black Engineers. Okay, so, um, you know, when, when we took office, the Society of, of Black Engineers, when the Chicago Six in our junior year, um, you know, that was really just the beginning of you know the 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 outreach to the rest of the campus uh, and our first event a lot of people think about this this national conference and they think about wow how did they, you know how did you guys do that and so forth well um the first thing i need you to understand is that we had an ally at purdue you know and purdue had hundreds of conferences over the course of a year. They were good at the conference business, okay? So uh, we had an infrastructure that we could just tap into. They helped us to plan for that. Uh, but what led to the national conference were two events that we held. The first was uh, the outreach to high school counselors in the state of Indiana. And that was a joint conference with the Society of Black Engineers and the Society of Women Engineers. So we, you know, we we got up and talked about, you know, our organization. And the Society of Women Engineers talked about their organization. The president of the university talked about the importance of both. And so you had high school counselors from all over the state of Indiana that now knew that if they had students who were interested in engineering, women students, black students, that they could point them to Purdue and there would be a soft landing. You know, there would be a welcome pad for these students. That was a, you know, a tremendous success. Uh, um, so then after that, we had a corporate banquet and that it would be equivalent to the first job fair. Um, Brian Harris, who was our projects manager, called it, uh, in, we had informal interview sessions uh, during that because we, we got to dine with the corporate leaders, corporate recruiters, and we got to chat with them. Uh, and those informal chats turned into, in some cases, formal job offers. So that was, in effect, the first job fair. You know, and after those uh, successful events, then, uh, you know, we had credibility on the campus. And uh, when, you know, when we asked to, uh, to be allowed to hold a national conference, the answer was yes. And it wasn't difficult, okay? Uh, you know, and the reason it wasn't difficult is because of how I opened up my presentation. You know, the national momentum uh, had already been established in 1972 by the National Academy of Engineering, the Sloan Foundation, okay, and all these committees that uh, had started. You know, the minority engineering programs. Uh, uh, were being modeled in many cases after the Purdue model of a minority engineering program. Uh, so that's that. You know that's how this thing came together. 
now, you know, you ask how the other students, uh, you know, how the other students perceived us. What I can tell you is that John Logan and I uh, were asked to serve on uh, an honorary uh, student committee. It's called Iron Key. And this was a, a committee of students that would meet periodically with the president of Purdue University. So we were, you know, you know, supposedly going to be his eyes and ears into the heartbeat of whatever, you know, part of the student body that we represented. So I'd say there were maybe, you know, 20 students uh, uh, that had been selected for whatever, you know, campus leadership they had been involved in. Uh, and, you know, we came together for the first meeting. And I can tell you this, John Logan and I did not feel comfortable. Okay, we did not feel comfortable. Now, uh, we did not participate in that organization because we didn't feel comfortable. Okay, now, looking back on it now, I see it as a missed opportunity. Those could have been great kids, but they weren't probably weren't comfortable with us and we weren't comfortable with them. And so, we, you know, we really didn't have, we didn't take advantage of it, of that opportunity to get to know them. Uh, you know, and I've, I have actually have a very good friend uh, that I met through the Purdue Alumni Association and we discovered that we were on campus at the same time. We didn't know each other, you know, but we were there at the same for, you know, Three, we had three years in common in the electrical engineering building. And uh, he's a great guy, okay? And I, you know, I would bet you, I'd be willing to bet you that all those other students, they were great people. They were selected because they had already distinguished themselves, you know, as, you know, leaders on the Purdue campus. But psychologically, John Logan and I were not ready you know, to mix it up with them, okay? Uh, you know, and even after I went to work in the workplace, it was actually more difficult. The transition into the workplace was more difficult than the transition from high school to college. Why? Because going from high school to college, I had all my boys, okay? You know, the fifth year, I mean, the, the first year of college was like the fifth year of high school for us. So that was, you know, that was really, that was not a challenge. And that's, I think, why we, we did so well. But now when I graduated and went to work for General Electric in Cleveland, Ohio, new city, new job, new company, new everything, okay. You know, I didn't know anyone there in my age group. And uh, so that was a challenge. That was a major challenge, and, you know, and so finally I decided I've got to, I have to have something that I'm familiar with. So I looked for a job in Chicago, <laughs> you know, and once I got to Chicago and I had my, you know, my peer group and, you know, my social uh, support group, my family, what, you know, my career, my career thrived. So that's how important uh, you know, this whole idea of, of you know, having a Nesby network is, you know, you have, it's a family and you're helping each other. And, you know, and it's, you know, it, it develops into a love of your, of your teammates, you know, and that's what you need to thrive. So as you can see, I don't, I'm not a succinct responder to questions. <laughs> That's just, you know, the way I am. Well, I even appreciate that even more. Um, those, those personal stories, uh, I got a little bit of a chill um, because we just, we just look at today's time, but you would not be here today if it wasn't for that backstory that you shared with us. So thank you. That was perfect. That was better than I expected. 
Thank you so much. Uh, again, I'm, I'm looking and listening to a Hall of Famer. I, my wife just po- one last thing and I'll, I'll shut up. Um, my wife just poked in. She said, how much longer? I said, oh, no, no. I said, come here. Look at this guy here. George Smith. <laughs> he is one of the founders of Nesby. And she like, OK. I said, this is this is a Hall of Famer. I'm talking to a Hall of Famer. All right. Thank you, sir. I just want to say this. I, you know, uh, he, he, none of us went into this, to, you know, to for all this attention that we get. But I get it. OK, I get it. Uh, because growing up, you know, uh, if you were in, if I, had, if you were in Major League Baseball, okay, I was like a kid in a candy store. I was in my mid thirties, and you know, I got invited into a Major League locker room. Okay, and I felt like I was ten years old because I was, I finally made it. I'm in the majors, <laughs> so I get it. Okay. But you need to also understand that I have my superheroes. And my superheroes are the black inventors, past and present. And I got an opportunity uh, in, uh, let's see, what was that? The day of the uh, Tulsa uh, 100 celebration, I don't even know what month it was now, but you know, that day. Uh, that was the inaugural event for the Black Inventors Hall of Fame. And I got invited to that because they know that I talk about these Black inventors all the time. And so I walked in this room. See, I've been reading stories about Black inventors to my grandsons ever since he was in uh, kindergarten. I walk in this room and, you know, if they didn't have a mask on, I knew who they were. <laughs> okay. You know, and so... Uh, so that's what I mean. I get it. I get it. Well, I wanted to uh, make sure that I, uh, like Marshall said, and I wanted to first say thanks, Marshall, for, <laughs> for coming out. Uh, it's good to like hear your voice, and uh, Marshall is a past. NSP vice president, NSP leader uh, for RTP NSP. And so one of the most uh, enthusiastic and like dedicated people. So uh, thanks for being here tonight, as well as everyone else. Uh, we had a, a number of past NSP members, like all, everyone on the call right now. Uh, I, I shouldn't have. Uh, shown a uh, single one person out, but everybody on the call right now is um, a great, uh, you know, member of NSB. And so we wanted to make sure that we give you uh, some more uh, thanks and um, just wanted to make sure everyone saw these uh, collection of photos that we put together uh, from over the years. And um, we uh, also, not to like skip forward, uh, but just wanted to, this is for uh, Kabod and Kabood. And then this one is for thanking you uh, for you being here tonight, a certificate of appreciation. Uh, for attending and being our keynote speaker tonight. And in like the real kind of a uh, non-virtual world, we would have uh, presented this to you in a, a plaque and uh, or a frame and uh, shook your hand and uh, <laughs> thank you for coming. And so, um, but we'll make sure to get this to you uh, via the mail. Uh, and uh, thank you for, for speaking tonight. And uh, you. you're welcome.